These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Today, we're going to destroy Jerusalem, no matter how long it takes. And not because we hate the Jews, this series has ballooned because I'm personally fascinated by all of this, but because this series has now taken the entire year, vastly beyond what I had expected for it, and it just needs to get done. Any other Bible-focused episodes that I put together will all get released as special episodes ahead of New Year's, or they may have already been released, depending on how my schedule works out. I do record these a little bit in advance. And then January 10th, we'll see us returning to Mesopotamia, where we will comfortably remain until the end of the series. We begin in about the year 643 BCE. Judah, after nearly being destroyed, has more or less recovered kind of completely in a material sense. The South is, for the first time in history, wealthier than the North, though this is in large part because the North is, you know, while no longer a smoking ruin, largely left as a desolation by their Assyrian conquerors. Spiritually, however, the kingdom is in dire shape, at least by biblical standards, and after the eminently pagan king Manasseh passes away, he's replaced by his even more pagan son, Ammon, who, it seems, intends to largely continue and amplify his father's policies, at least in the religious and moral sphere. Scripture itself records very little about Ammon, but rabbinic tradition holds that he was the most wicked of all the wicked kings of Israel or Judah, and they really let their imaginations run wild with the sort of debaucheries he engaged in. And there may be something behind all those rumors. We get only a few sentences in both Kings and Chronicles, and the core of it is that he didn't humble himself before God, then lived only two years on the throne, then a palace coup of some kind killed him. This palace coup suggests it wasn't actually Yahwist opposition that was his downfall, and so it could have been that he was, as a new king, quite weak, or that he had personal failings which drove allies away. But of course, through all this, the Yahwist faction was definitely ready and an active part of the instability, since they were ready with a candidate for the throne of their own, and they end up winning the subsequent power struggle, placing the eight-year-old son of Ammon on the throne. This youth is Josiah, and his 31 years on the throne will be the most crucial for the development of Judaism out of any historical period. For Christians, only the years of Jesus himself eclipse Josiah's reign in importance. Josiah is put on the throne by the Yahwist faction, and is in his early years nothing but a puppet for them. As he grows up, he's educated by Yahwists, but he doesn't become bitter at this. He fully embraces the ideology of the God of Abraham. By the time that he's 20 years old, he's ruling fully in his own right, and starts tearing down pagan worship sites. This appears to be how he legitimized his rule to a certain degree. We've long seen that new rulers like to have military victories to show off their strength, but given the political context of this era, which we're going to look at in a bit, there were no external enemies for him. And so, and this is the first time we know of this happening in human history, Josiah's going to assemble an army of the faithful with an explicit mission of traveling through his own territory and attacking his own subjects based on their religious affiliation. I say, though, that he's traveling through his own territory, but what exactly his territory is has become a bit fuzzy since the latter part of Manasseh's reign. 
You see, when Judah became an Assyrian client state during Hezekiah's days, it appears that a chunk of territory fell out of Judah and into the hands of various Assyrian-aligned neighbors, or just into a state of such desolation that they were essentially no one's lands. Now, this was all well and good when the Assyrian domination meant that no one was allowed to fight over territory, but the Assyrians are now receding, distracted by events in the east and falling into what will turn into terminal decline. In the west, especially the less valuable parts of the west, Assyrian governance, which has always been light, has essentially vanished. Now, it hasn't formally vanished yet. They haven't been beaten by enemies or renounced any claims. But gradually, various Assyrian-aligned entities start to make their presence felt in the Levant on, in the place of the former Mesopotamian Empire. Now, biggest of these is the newly resurgent Egyptians under Pharaoh Tzamtik, more famous under his Greek name Sametikos. Though he's nominally an Assyrian vassal, over the course of his long reign, he has slowly begun to act more independently. And now, after 30 years on the throne, he's got enough of a power base along the Nile to start moving into the Levant, converting the Philistines from Assyrian vassals to Egyptian vassals, who also support Assyria because, you know, Egypt is still technically Assyrian. There's also signs he may be initiating friendly or not-so-friendly contacts with the empty regions of Judah and Israel, and attempting trade contacts with the Phoenicians. Then there are the more exotic entrants into the region, such as tremendously successful Greek traders and Greek mercenaries, as well as a number of Scythians, currently based in Anatolia, but natively from as far away as Ukraine and southern Russia, yet now raiding well into Lebanon and below. But none of this is warfare, per se, or great power conflict, for sure. So far, it's nothing more than a bit of raiding, and that's all we can see in the written or archaeological record for the region at this point. It's all simply influence, protection, diplomacy, and commerce, all shifting people's loyalties around. And it's into this that Josiah takes his mighty crusade. He's not conquering territory. Indeed, he's not really fighting any organized resistance. He's just essentially raiding into his own territory to enforce his religious decrees. Except that he has an extremely expansive definition of his own territory, reaching into lands not controlled by Jerusalem since the days of King Solomon. Some see him here as simply consumed with religious fervor, obsessed with the idea that all of Israel is rightfully his by God and desiring a good old-fashioned crusade to purge the heretics and burn the witches. And for sure, there's got to be an element to that. Josiah sure did love the more action-packed parts of Scripture and emulated them more fully than maybe some of the other parts. But also, it can hardly have escaped his notice that with the receding tide of Assyria, there was no one left in the region to act as the indigenous regional power. The Philistines were too weak. The Phoenicians were rich, but not really interested in landward expansion. The traditional enemies north of Judah had never recovered from Assyrian domination, and the folks of the desert were at a low ebb as well. It has to be this way, because, receding or not, he is an Assyrian vassal moving in to Assyrian territory. And I should note that archaeology tells us this would have been a fairly easy campaign, as the settlements of Assyrian-dominated Israel were all torn down from their mountains, and they were rebuilt in the low places, typically without any walls, to keep them, on one hand, closer to the economically more valuable lowlands, while simultaneously keeping them from being able to defend themselves against their overlords, 
or you know anybody at all. Similarly, the Egyptians are technically only just extending protection to their fellow Assyrian vassals, not as extending their zone of influence at Assyrian expense, at least not officially. But that'll matter more in a bit. For now, Judah is ascendant in a way it hasn't been for a long, long time, and Josiah is coupling that very strongly with his new religious convictions. This also happens to fulfill a prophecy made during the time of the original Jeroboam, though whether Josiah did all this in order to fulfill the prophecy, or if the prophecy was invented around this time as a result of the king's actions, or if it was only recognized as being prophetic fulfillment by later subscribes, I mean, that's ultimately unknowable outside of your own religious conviction on the matter. Six years later, in the year 622 BCE, because we're counting down to 586 now, 622 down to 586 is, I don't know, Math is hard. Anyway, the king has some money burning a hole in his pocket after this long crusade. Tax revenues are up, partly from increased prosperity and also partly because he seems to be raising taxes. And at the same time, all his plunder revenues are up because, as the Vikings learned in England, raiding a bunch of religious centers is a great way to get your hands on lightly guarded treasure. Plus, the interest groups who supported his father's desecration of the temple have now been militarily defeated over the course of the last 18 years. And so, being a good Yahwist, his concern is to rebuild the temple. Now, matters go pretty normally until one day, Hilkiah the priest shows up in Josiah's throne room with a dusty old scroll. He claims that he found that scroll in a neglected part of the temple during the reconstruction. Then he claims that it's an ancient scripture, which proves that between the ongoing paganism of the nation, plus corruption with the oral tradition upon which the Yahwists have been relying, the entire nation has, accidentally or intentionally, apostatized and is now under an unbreakable curse from the national god. Now, before we get too deep into the identity of this document, and trust me, we will, let's real quick look at what Josiah did under the influence of this document. Now, the chronology between Kings and Chronicles is a bit debated here, since Chronicles has some reforms both before and after finding the book, while Kings goes right into the finding of the book. Some have suggested that, therefore, Chronicles is jumping the gun here, and that no reforms took place prior to Josiah's new book. But this seems misguided to me. First of all, we've seen before that all ancient histories, both in Kings and in Mesopotamian histories that we've read, sometimes things get organized topically within a reign rather than strictly chronologically. Here we get specific dates from the chronicler, and nothing contradicts those in Kings. Secondly, we know that the two books will often omit episodes found in the other book, just because the focus of each is different, and Kings explicitly tells us to go read, you know, some other book to go get the fuller story. These books are always now lost to us, but the King's author, he didn't know about that. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the king's account starts by saying Josiah was always faithful throughout his life. And the very first episode we hear prior to the discovery of the book is the restoration of the temple. So we know even before finding this book that he had a decided interest in piety. So it seems in all this that we have a king who loves God wanted to do his kingly duty to repair the temple, then he finds a lost book. 
Now he needs to get that book confirmed, so he goes to a prophet of God to get the auguries taken over it. Now he did have the prophet Jeremiah available to him at this point, but for all that Jeremiah is my favorite prophet, he also has exactly zero chill. So instead, Josiah goes to the less famous prophet named Huldah. Huldah does confirm that what he has is true scripture, but then she still manages to break the news that Judah is actually, you know, kind of, sort of going to be destroyed for her wickedness and apostasy. But, but the destruction's not going to come until Josiah's dead. Promise. Guaranteed. The next bit is interesting, then. Josiah pulls the nation together, or at least all the major leaders, to reconfirm a covenant with God found in his new book. Then, having received word that a major doom would come upon the people, Josiah searched his scriptures for an historical precedent of what the Jewish people should do when a doom is foretold, and very interestingly decides to hold a Passover, in hopes that the ritual of covenantal obedience should cause this doom to pass over them as well. And of course, they had quite a nice Passover, but it ultimately accomplished little, because Chronicles will skip over about a decade at this point to get right to Josiah's death, while Kings will throw in the detail of Josiah's reforms before then getting to his death. But we are safe in assuming that the final decade or so of Josiah's life was spent in further religious reforms, all motivated ultimately by the finding of a certain book. Now, for many people, both then and now, the story of the discovery of the Book of the Law of the Lord has raised alarm bells because it sounds very, very remarkable. Imagine, imagine if you will, close your eyes if you're not driving or doing anything important. Keep your eyes open if you're driving. Imagine in our own day, someone showed up with a whole new set of scriptures, and these scriptures proved that the generations since the completion of our present Bible had mistakenly fallen into apostasy, and that our existing traditions and writings, while you know, largely on the right track, were incomplete, and in some cases corrupted in a way that led us into wicked practices. Now, if we had such a thing, the two possible reactions would either be to reject that the book was fake and call the author a fraud, and declare that what we already have is necessarily perfect because the traditions of our ancestors, who are human, are incapable of falling into error over long periods of time. That would be one approach. Or we could do as Josiah does and tear our clothes in anguish, repent of our wickedness, and do our best to follow this new scripture. Now, some of you know exactly where I'm going with this, and you're excited for me to dunk on the atheists who accuse Hilkiah the priest of being a fraud and of having essentially authored large chunks of the modern Bible. But I haven't gotten to Hilkiah yet. We're still in our uh, present-day example, and obviously I'm still talking about Joseph Smith. And boy, isn't that a fun exercise for Christians and Jews who accept the restoration of a Josiah to ask why exactly, contrary to the atheists, we should accept the ancient restoration of Josiah, but not accept the restorations of the Latter-day Saints. Now, this is less of a fun exercise for atheists because, of course, they're going to reject both texts for broadly similar reasons. And it's also less fun for Mormons because they're going to accept both texts for broadly similar reasons. Any argument you raise against Joseph Smith, try taking those same words and applying them to Josiah or Hilkiah, depending on who you think is the source of this revelation here, or vice versa, your defenses of Hilkiah, are they not defenses of Joseph Smith? 
but I leave elaboration on that as an exercise for the reader. It's not a circle that can't be squared, but it's certainly something insufficiently considered, in my own opinion. Getting out of modern day, we have no idea, no idea at all, what book Hilkiah the priest found in that temple. It was called the Book of the Law, and it is widely believed that this book was specifically either Deuteronomy or the main speeches of Deuteronomy, with the historical framing before and after being part of the oral tradition. But we don't actually know that, and this force forms the first step in our rung of a ladder of big Josiah problems. The Book of the Law could have been some completely unknown book, or it could have been the entire Pentateuch, or it's been suggested that none of the law portions of the Pentateuch yet existed, and this was a prototype of those which got later mangled and rewritten into the various law segments scattered around the books of Moses, or it could have been that no such book existed. Josiah just pretended it did to justify his reforms. Or it could be that the book never existed and Josiah never had any reforms. It was all made up by exilic or post-exilic authors. And depending on what book you assume Hilkiah has found, that affects what books you believe they already had. Most online and many of the sloppier scholarly efforts at analyzing this period, and I'm not going to mince words here, there are many many extremely sloppy scholarly analyses of this event, which have been and continue to be published in both skeptical and faithful journals. And honestly, I feel like my brain has rotted from too many hours of reading through them. But the truth is that many will simply state that they know based usually on some pretty flimsy reasoning, that one particular scenario is the true identity of the Book of the Law, and then proceed by reasoning from there. And in this way, many will build speculation upon speculation until they've built a grand edifice of their own imaginings, then confidently proclaim it to be the ironclad historical truth, definitively proving or disproving their own particular faith or lack thereof. But no, when you start from an uncertain foundation, every step you take after that becomes less certain, and further elaboration only weakens your theory because each detail is increasingly uncertain. So we need to start by understanding what we can say about the Book of the Law. Now certainly, the most common speculation, and the traditional one of the mainstream rabbis and church fathers, is that the Book of the Law was Deuteronomy. The first hint is in the name. Deutero means second, and nomos means law, so Deuteronomy is the second law, the other, the first four books having the first law, and then Deuteronomy sort of being a repetition of what came before. The second hint is that many of the cultic reforms Josiah undertakes follows the suggestions of God in Deuteronomy, because of course, God just likes making suggestions. Though in this, Chronicles has his reforms beginning prior to finding the book, and those reforms also match some of the themes of Deuteronomy as well, plus the degree to which Deuteronomy fits the Jerusalem focus of the cult in Josiah's time. That's pretty shaky as well. We've looked at that in earlier episodes. There is the matter of the covenant, which all the people swore under Josiah, and Deuteronomy does have a covenantal focus, but honestly, there's a covenantal focus in the other books of Moses as well. And so a proto or derivative work could also have had a covenant focus as well. An additional hint, though, is in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where it gives an instruction that these laws should be recorded in two places. 
one copy held by the priests and one by the king. And given the apostasy of the previous generation of kings plus the neglect of the temple, it should be little surprise that only one copy exists and is to be found in the temple, based on this rule that only two copies of Deuteronomy should have existed during the monarchical period. As to the other classes of speculation, we're going to group them into categories, otherwise we're going to be here all day. The other option is that the Book of the Law was some other legal text, perhaps a derivative work based on the Pentateuch, perhaps either written by or attributed to one of the early kings of Judah. Or perhaps it was the source text for the legal codes in the Pentateuch. Though these seem like opposites, they are related claims, with the only difference being if you think the books of Moses predate or postdate Josiah. The arguments for these are similar to the arguments for Deuteronomy, except more vague. Because, of course, if this is what the Book of the Law was, then we no longer have any extant copies to examine. And so, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to ignore this claim, and any time I talk about this book being Deuteronomy, just assume that I'm keeping the options open for a book that isn't literally Deuteronomy, but somehow related to the Law of God more generally, sort of expanding our first category here a bit. Another suggestion has been that the Book of the Law was in fact Leviticus, or a portion of Leviticus known as the Holiness Codes. This has been suggested because of the intense cultic focus of Josiah's reforms and how his Passover is focused on getting portions of the Holiness Codes quite right. It is, however, unlikely that this alone is what was found, as Leviticus's Holiness Codes section lacks many of the distinctive features of Josiah's reaction, like the foretelling of doom upon the people and the covenant relationship. However, Levitical texts do make sense for being found in the temple, since that's where they would have been most commonly applied, so while these may have been found alongside, or as a portion of what was found, it seems likely that Leviticus wasn't the whole of the Book of the Law of the Lord. Now, it's also been proposed that the entire Pentateuch was lost and then found again. Now, some have doubted this because Josiah seems to have read through it pretty quickly which would have been much more of a struggle for the entire set of Mosaic books. On the other hand, one of his key reforms is the Passover, which seems to have been forgotten about for a while during the apostasy. And while it does feature in Deuteronomy, it features far more prominently in Exodus. One would assume that for the Yahwist faith to have persisted without any of these texts, an oral tradition would likely have held on to most of it, but perhaps the texts themselves, even the books of Moses, were not as widely distributed or read as they would be in the Second Temple period and in later times. Which, I mean, actually does make sense. These are not yet the people of the book. They're a system of priests who maintain a central set of documents handed down from prior generations in a temple context, which honestly makes them in form, essentially the same as all the other temple-based faiths around them, only differing in theological details. If this is the case, it would be far more of a remarkable thing to witness. But in practical effect, it's little different since the same prophecy of doom and the same recognition of disobedience to the ancestral covenant would be in play, as if it were only Deuteronomy being discovered, and not the entire Pentateuch. But in our listing of possibilities, another one put forward is that Josiah found nothing at all, and merely pretended to have found a text in order to secure his reign and justify his reforms. Now, the variant of this which claims no text ever existed, and no text was ever produced as a result, is ultimately silly enough to reject pretty much outright. Fundamentally, the primary opposition to Josiah's rule, as far as we can tell, was the pagan faction within the country, 
we don't hear about dynastic struggles, and Assyria seems to have been quite happy with them as a vassal. And yet, the idea of buying legitimacy from an imposing religion by inventing a fake holy book seems about as convincing as the modern-day state of Israel getting their Muslim neighbors to stop fighting them by claiming to have a new revelation from God and then not allowing them to read it. Josiah fundamentally didn't need any new revelation to do the things his own power base already wanted him to do, and he didn't need any new revelation to beat the tar out of his enemies either. He just needed an army. But more common than the claim that no text ever existed is the claim that Hilkiah never found anything, but instead authored the text himself, passing it off as authentic scripture. Whether or not Josiah was complicit in this or anybody else is really beside the point. And this is really the heart of the debate. Although, as you can see, it's a debate that has many many tentacles spreading all throughout the oldest parts of Scripture, leading on one hand to a plethora of faithful interpretive debates, and on the other hand to many more secular claims against many of the most fundamental portions of Scripture. There's no one secular claim, which is part of the problem I'm facing in keeping this episode organized, but one pretty popular way of understanding the Hilkiah made it up camp is that by the time of Josiah, there was a group of Yahwists who were, up until this point, perfectly standard polytheists. However, while acting as a Syrian clients, the priests of Yahweh cynically decided to copy the supremacist claims that the Assyrians made about their god Asher and apply them to Yahweh. Then to support this, Hilkiah, perhaps along with a group of clever writers, fabricated the book of Deuteronomy in order to invent the religion of Judaism. And from this fundament, they and their successors spent the next century and a half inventing ever more scriptures, sometimes by perverting earlier oral traditions, and sometimes through pure fabrication, as a cynical grift to keep the Judahites paying their tithes during the Babylonian exile. Then, by the end of the exile, the Khan had gone on for so long that everyone had drunk their own Kool-Aid, leading to the invention of monotheistic religion as we have it today quite by accident. Now, not everyone is quite that cynical about it, but the bottom line is pretty consistent here throughout many, many skeptical claims. So, having branched it all out in a few of the million possible ways, I'm now going to reduce the so-called Deuteronomistic question down to two main, very broad possibilities. Either Hilkiah found a book which included something substantially similar to Deuteronomy as part of its contents, or Hilkiah authored such a book and passed it off as ancient. Historical analogy often gets deployed at this stage, but that's honestly unhelpful, since there are compelling analogous stories, both of ancient texts actually genuinely being rediscovered, and of ancient texts just being forged, throughout both Mesopotamian and wider world history. And of course, we don't have any good way to get at the original text itself, being long since lost to a chain of transmission, the oldest surviving text being at least 400 years later than this event. But what we can do is ask if Deuteronomy existed prior to Josiah, which is an interesting investigation for both sides of the debate since we want to a. figure out if it was invented during Josiah's reign, and b. if it existed prior to that, when was it lost? The most direct evidence would be archaeological, but we already know that we aren't likely to find much of that, given the general trouble with archaeology we've had throughout this Israel series. The next most direct evidence would be the testimony of the Bible, except that the antiquity of the Bible is exactly what we're trying to prove, so much of that has to be ignored for the sake of this discussion just to avoid circular reasoning. 
Once we ignore the Pentateuch, since we're trying to improve their antiquity, and we ignore the Deuteronomic histories, in which the most expansive view is Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, since they're part of this very narrative which claims the antiquity of the Torah, and so they also have to be discarded for the moment. And so if we look only at archaeology, we can't say one way or another that the people of Israel and Judah had anything aside from a god named Yahweh, an aversion to pigs, and a plurality of temples. But there is one suggestive thing we can look at. Though we've discounted much of the Bible as being invalid for proving its own validity, we need to always remember that the Bible's not a single book, but many different books written by different people at different times, and some of the earliest works in there are the early prophets, with Micah, Hosea, and at least the early Isaiah being pretty uncontroversially dated to around the fall of Israel. So the end of the 700s, at best, a good century prior to Josiah. And what we find when searching the early prophets is that they seem to know the specific wording of certain lines in Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Leviticus, and they seem generally familiar with many stories and general historical facts found in Genesis, Numbers, Joshua, and Judges. While the specifics of this claim go deeper into the biblical text than this already, oh my goodness, already really long episode has time for, it does give us an independent witness that at least some Yahwists had access to the text of Deuteronomy and Leviticus in particular, during and before the reign of Hezekiah, and that the framework of the histories we read about in the first seven books of the Old Testament was in common currency. This doesn't discount the possibility that they did have all five books of Moses at this point, but we can't confirm quite that much directly just from quotes of the early prophets. One other thing to consider, though, is the divergent witness of the Samaritans. In many ways, we know less of their faith at this time than we do the Jerusalem sect, but we do know two key things. First, from a very early period, they had a Yahweh cult, though it differed in its practice compared to the South. Second, in the Greek period at least, if not the Persian period, they had an independent manuscript tradition of the Torah, with relatively minor changes and none of the other books of Scripture. Now, secular scholars disagree about when the Samaritans came into existence as a separate group, with some remarkably even suggesting that they didn't actually exist until the Byzantine period, despite ample prior witness. But working backwards from there, we know they existed as a separate group at the time of Christ because of New Testament references as well as Roman references to the fact that both the Samaritans existed and the fact that there was a mutual animosity between them and the Jews. Then, heading back even further from Greek and Persian sources, we know that they existed right as the Jews were coming back from Babylon, as secular records recount the fact that shortly after the Jewish Second Temple was constructed in Jerusalem, an altar was also constructed by the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans claim this to have been their second construction on the site, which supposedly still stands to this day, with the first having been sealed away by God in response to the wickedness of King Saul, or perhaps simply destroyed by either David or Saul over cultic disagreements. Now, most commentators, both modern scholars and theologians, have assumed that the Samaritans are just lying about their ancient pedigree, under the assumption that all Samaritans are ignorant, filthy, barbarian savages, whose very existence blasphemes the glory of God, and not a one of them has ever been any good. But I would consider this. Even if we do assume the very worst of the Samaritans, they built a temple in the Persian period because they had, at that point, the book of Deuteronomy commanding them to. 
But they couldn't have gotten that book from the newly arrived Jews, partly because the two groups hated each other. And it seems unlikely that they would be pursuing bitter religious lawsuits in Persian court against each other's temples while simultaneously be adopting each other's holy books. That would be rather similar to modern-day Israelis suddenly deciding to adopt the Koran, but at the same time continuing to oppose the Dome of the Rock. Also, if the Samaritans were receiving scripture during the Persian period, what reason would they have to accept only five books? Their own histories differ from the biblical histories, and they reject all the later prophets outright. And so they must have gotten Deuteronomy before this split. Now, another time they could have gotten scripture is during Josiah's invasion. And yet here, too, we have to ask both, why would they accept and cling to an invader's scripture after so long with their own traditions? But also, Josiah had some prophets as well as Torah. Why on earth would they accept from their invader one portion of scripture, but not another? Now, continuing to work backwards, no one thinks that Manasseh did any Yahwistic proselytizing, and if he did, it's far more likely that he would try and convince the Northerners to accept Judahite histories, not the Torah or the prophets. Then there was Hezekiah, who was probably too busy to impose scriptures on the North, but it's at least conceivable that the Northerners who came to his great Passover celebration received a copy of Deuteronomy as a door prize. Though these were the ones coming to Jerusalem to celebrate, why would they be opposed to Jerusalem as the site of the Deuteronomic cultic center? Though, on this note, I can start to see gradual changes maybe affecting the reading of those passages during the period of the Babylonian exile. Anyway, the point is that if they did get the scripture from Hezekiah, which as far as I see is the latest they possibly could have gotten it, they wouldn't have necessarily had a tradition of written prophets to go along with it, at least not from any of the surviving prophetic writings. And far more likely, I think they received Deuteronomy right around when they claimed to have, way back before either Israel split into two kingdoms, or before Israel even existed as a kingdom during the time of the Judges. And given the frequent animosity between the two kingdoms following the divided monarchy, and yet the minimal amount of differences between the Samaritan and Masoretic textual traditions, it seems to me extremely likely that, in fact, the entire Torah predates at least the divided monarchy, while all the rest of it postdates the divided monarchy. And so it would seem from the prophetic witness and the Samaritan comparison that the Torah did exist in something close to its modern form during the reign of Hezekiah. And it would seem from the tale of Josiah that either the whole Torah or parts of it, specifically Deuteronomy, had been lost during the 57 years of actively anti-Yahwist kings between Hezekiah and Josiah. Now, I don't expect to settle the debate here on these purely historicist grounds, but this is at least the primary thrust of the traditionalist argument when divorced from the matter of faith. Now, having established all that, we're not done. There's one more line of argument to get into on this question. Part of the argument that Deuteronomy didn't exist prior to Josiah was that it like most or all biblical books, were radically rewritten and redacted many times over many generations. It's claimed that a science known as textual criticism can, thousands of years after the fact, disentangle the various threads of these different authors. Now, textual criticism is a pretty wide discipline. It covers a lot of ground, but there's a specific sort of thing which also calls itself textual criticism and only applies to the scriptures, which I'm talking about here. To give you an example, one scholar claims that he sees three layers of redaction in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verses 2 through 8 discuss the inheritance of the Levites, 
and these, according to the scholar, were obviously written by a Levitical author who put these lines in in order to get wealth from the people. Verses 9 through 13 then shift to discussing a prohibition against indigenous Canaanite religious practices. So these must have been written during the Babylonian exile to prevent the people from following Babylonian customs. Verses 14 through 22 are messianic, so they were written by the priestly class, attempting to control the people of Israel at yet a third time. They couldn't have all been written by the same person because they are different topics, one after the other. In this manner, any time I, a sophisticated reader, perceives a shift in message, tone, or focus, I naturally assume that a different author must have written it. And this methodology can be applied and is applied to New Testament works just as easily, with even the least controversial letters of Paul showing multiple evidence of multiple hands on them. Now, this sort of redactor hunting is the source of the famous JEPD hypothesis, which sees four authors in the five books of Moses. But like I said, there are countless variations. And indeed, that's kind of the problem. There are very nearly as many variants as there are scholars examining it. Because for all that I try, I'm trying to write this section without bias. But this exercises fundamentally bunk pseudoscience of the worst sort. The worst part of it, the, the underlying claim that multiple authors affected the text of scripture as we have it today, the worst part is that that's a fundamentally compelling claim. Textual differences can be found in scripture, and some of them are quite possibly intentional. But this technique is ultimately so subjective that it accomplishes nothing. And I say this as somebody who looked pretty deeply into it, not just ahead of this episode. When I was a younger atheist, I read a book about how all of Paul's letters, but also the Gospels, could be chopped up into an arbitrary number of later writers. I remember particularly how the passage where Jesus rebukes Peter with his famous, Get thee behind me, Satan! supposedly had four different authors all in a single sentence. And with a clever enough scholar, all the conflicting teleological motivations can be teased out at length in a way that sounds quite convincing, even to somebody very intelligent. The problem with it, though, is that it's not rigorous. It's not repeatable. When approaching a text without a previous critic's textual divisions already in mind, it's nearly inevitable that differing divisions get selected. This is why JEPD is no longer current in modern critical thinking. As more and more people approached it from first principles, they all agreed on the outcome, that the Bible is a sham written by a ton of cynical authors but none of them could generate the same division of which passages belong to which supposed authors. Now, sure, of course, there's some overlap, but there's enough difference that you can see when you compare these scholars together, you can see the arbitrariness. Similarly, the Deuteronomic hypothesis, invented by some Germans in the 1800s that Ju Josiah wrote Deuteronomy plus all the Deuteronomic histories, has also been picked apart into a dozen different sub-arguments, none of which can agree on the order of various redactors or which parts belong to which strata. To add on to all of this, there's simply no evidence for these layers upon layers of strata within the text in nearly all of these cases. I do say nearly all, though, because the times what we do have evidence of layers, it's in every case extremely obvious and extremely well known about. In the New Testament, for example, where we have the very best evidence of these layers, the famous story in John's Gospel of the woman caught in adultery, that simply doesn't exist in the oldest manuscripts. 
Similarly, the ending of Mark's gospel was clearly added in later, because some scribes have it and others just don't. All of these other proposed layers of authorship, though, they're extremely unlikely, simply because we don't have divergent textual traditions for nearly all of it. When we do have divergent texts, which are our sources, we almost always see those branching off. It's much more rare for major differences to just get cut off at the, in, at the branch somewhere, and then we never see it develop onward. We never see conflicting traditions. If there are changes made noticeably after the original authorship, almost always we get multiple works coming out of that. Moving on to the Old Testament, we know not to trust any of the numbers throughout most of the Old Testament because, because we have extensive disagreement among the manuscripts about a large number of numbers between the Samaritan manuscript, the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that the numbers aren't consistent with any of them because these things frequently changed, though in the case of the numbers, it's because Hebrew numbers are apparently very easy to misread. Then with Deuteronomy in particular, we really only have two textual traditions that have serious content changes. We have the aforementioned Samaritan version, and we have the Jewish version represented in the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Those last two do have differences, but they're relatively minor, all things considered. All of which means that any editing had to have happened so deeply in time that the previous variant traditions were lost. And yet the whole point of textual analysis is to claim that the creation of these texts was both very late and stretched out over an extended period, something which would have generated multiple child texts from all these revision traditions, absent a great centralizing figure. And of course, we're talking about the Babylonian exile. There was no centralizing figure. We look at the Quran, for instance, and we know that there were multiple early variants of the Quran, but that once the Arabs had conquered a huge swath of territory, one of the early caliphs came in and burned all the variant traditions that he could find. Nothing of the sort could have possibly happened with the Jews, because after this point, they're now ruled until 1947 by outsiders who aren't going to care which tradition of their scripture is the authoritative one. And to close this out without getting too terribly deep into it all, like I'm, I'm almost at an hour, but I swear to you this is just the surface of all of this, because this is a rabbit hole deep enough to trap any unwary explorer. But the fundamental issue here is that the methodology of the textual critics in the case of scripture is simply wrong. I mean to say that even if they're 100% correct that this or that portion of the Bible is the product of multiple layers of redaction, their methodology is fundamentally unsuited to teasing out those layers. Which is, of course, when we get down to it, why this analysis is only ever applied to scripture and not to texts more generally and never to ones where the answer of the question of authorship and editing is knowable. Many modern textbooks at the middle and high school level, for example, are written by committees, sometimes with three to six primary authors, plus multiple rounds of academic review and revision. Now, that's not a criticism, that's just how those sort of things get produced. And yet it would be nearly impossible for anyone unconnected with the publication to look at the finished product to figure out which author and which layer of revision created this or that paragraph, even though we know that different authors in this case could well have been responsible for individual words within a sentence. 
or if you want a more do-it-at-home kind of exercise. You go home, you take a handful of Wikipedia articles of moderate length, and just read through them and see if you can predict their revision history without looking at the revision history page or the talk section. This last example is rather more like the biblical example because there are cases of Wikipedia articles that genuinely only have a single author and a single draft, aside from minor formatting and grammatical changes. While there are some which have been fought over for a decade or more, containing layer upon layer, and without opening up the revision section of Wikipedia, you may know that multiple editors are possible, but if you and an equally intelligent friend of yours attempt the same textual analysis on the same sets of Wikipedia articles, blind to the true revision history, I can guarantee that the two of you are going to come up with different analyses of the article. Unless you work together, of course. The point of all this is that for all the energy expended in discrediting Deuteronomy and the later historical works, there's good reason Good reason to think that Deuteronomy and the wider Torah are historically quite old, and that the main tool of criticism applied against them, textual analysis, is simply bunk. And yet for all that, we have good reason to think that it was around the time of Josiah that the so-called Deuteronomic histories were written down, or at least started, in a process that continued through the Babylonian exile. The text itself doesn't tell us this directly, but in the histories of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, we've had scattered throughout the text authorial inserts, letting us know that such and such a place can still be found, quote, to this day, and things like that. Now, of course, thousands of years later, many of these places are now lost to us, but if we follow the references to this day, we get a period of a few decades just prior to the fall of Jerusalem. Now, since no one expects that official historical writing was done with a Yahwist bent during Manasseh's 50 years, this has to have started at earliest under Josiah. Then Josiah dies and only 23 years pass until the final destruction of Jerusalem. Now, we know that the historical project continued during the exile but it's generally assumed that it was in the latter half of Josiah's reign, while things were still relatively peaceful and prosperous, and the king was fully committed both to the idea of scripture and to the temple cult in particular, that the thing really kicked off. While the idea of canonization didn't really exist yet beyond the Torah, the prophets of Isaiah, Nahum, Jonah, Hosea, and Micah were collected at this time, while Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk were active. Meanwhile, the temple scholars were going through their archives, summarizing the court records and possibly also oral traditions to compose the first collections of psalms, as well as the histories that we have been relying upon up until now. All in all, depending on the state of the completion of the project after some 30 years, the people of Jerusalem seem quite likely to have walked into Babylon with at least versions of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Psalms, Habakkuk, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Proverbs, if not more. Of the 39 modern books, this comes out to perhaps 20 books, though some definitely in partial or prototypical states at this point, such as Psalms, Proverbs, Jeremiah, and so on. Considering that when Josiah took the throne, they had five books, plus some prophetic writings that had just in the previous generation started to become popular, you can see why Josiah's reign represents the greatest shift in God's religion since Moses. Perhaps it's the initiation of a new dispensation, and one of the most important periods in Western religious history altogether, which is of course why I have babbled so endlessly on the topic. But though I have quite convinced views on the matter, if you haven't noticed, 
I do know that I'm not the last word on the topic. Just a minor footnote in many, many centuries of voluminous writings. And in a theoretical sense, I would encourage you to go read some of them, but I do warn you, there's a lot of hot garbage out there. And so with all that said, we're going to kill Josiah. Well, not us, not us. We're not going to kill him. Pharaoh Necho is going to kill him. As I mentioned earlier, the whole of the Levant had seen a waning of Assyria's power, to the extent that many of the lands now no longer had an effective master. Into this void, we've seen Josiah step in to militarily enforce his religious objectives, but also Pharaoh Tamtik quietly made at least many of the Philistine cities into de facto vassals of Egypt, and has possibly extended gentle influence in the rest of the region. Tamtik died in 610 BCE, and in the following year, 609 BCE, his son Neho needed to get to Carchemish to fight in a war. We won't get too deep into this war, but the short of it is that the Assyrian Empire is collapsing now more than ever, and one large contributor to that is the resurgent might of Babylon, which has by this point already defeated both the town of Asher and Nineveh, leaving only the western rump of Assyria, plus any vassals still loyal to the Assyrians. As Necho passed from Egypt to Carchemish, the natural land route took him through the towns of Philistia, then diagonally across the land of Israel. As he arrived at the crossroads town of Megiddo, though, he encountered Josiah. Now there is a bit of secular debate here. The text in Kings merely says that Josiah went to meet with Necho, then Necho killed him. A minor grammatical feature in the word meet is... According to linguistic experts, it's a very peaceable word here. Essentially, Josiah went to go hang out with Necho and then just happened to get killed. From this point of grammar, secular scholars decide that Josiah was judicially killed by his overlord. They say that to decide that there was no Battle of Megiddo. Now, today's episode is already long, but the short version here is that there's no evidence that Josiah was ever an Egyptian vassal. We can see, archaeologically, a transfer of influence in Philistia, especially around the town of Ekron, from Assyria to Egypt in this time. But we see nothing of the sort in Judah, which was only Egyptian for the four years following this battle. Chronicles tells us, that there was a battle at Megiddo, and the fact that Kings omits the battle, either out of embarrassment or some other reason, plus a minor grammatical quirk, is ultimately a bad reason to reject the idea of a battle here, especially as it would require a pretty dramatic and baseless reworking of the international situation. No, what seems to have happened is that both Egypt and Judah were scrambling in the previous years to claim the loyalty of the vassals falling out of Assyrian dominion, and Necho walking through Israel was interpreted by Josiah as either an attempt to bring the Sumerian territory under Egyptian influence, or would weaken Judah's influence in the region. And so he went to Megiddo to tell the Pharaoh that Pharaoh is not allowed to pass through Josiah's territory. And now Josiah is pretty, pretty much wrong on every account here. This isn't his territory. God appointed him ruler only over Judah, having destroyed Israel and cast it to the nations so that the land could have its Sabbaths or something like that. Secularly, it also isn't his territory, because it's Assyrian territory, and he is an Assyrian vassal. He's also wrong to stop the Egyptian army, because they're both Assyrian vassals. And theologically, he's wrong because God has appointed Egypt to march to their doom in this particular battle. And so by delaying them, Josiah could be indirectly saving Egypt. And militarily, he's wrong because a king can claim all the territory he wants, but if he doesn't have enough men with pointy sticks to keep out all the other pointy sticks, then his words are empty. 
And as it so happened, Josiah had a strong deficit in pointy sticks on this day, and the Battle of Megiddo was almost certainly so short that the Egyptians were not significantly delayed. As small as this battle was in purely military terms, in a wider sense, the looming destruction of Judah has now basically occurred. The Battle of the Hill of Megiddo, or Har Megiddo, remembered in later Greek as Armageddon, would become so strongly remembered in Jewish culture that it will not be equaled in theological significance until the Battle of Armageddon on the Day of the Lord's Judgment. And I stress, this original Battle of Armageddon was not a great battle, certainly smaller than most epic movie battles like Lord of the Rings, and very much a one-sided affair. But in the aftermath, Josiah is dead, indirectly at the hands of the Pharaoh, and having now defeated Judah in a pitched battle, Egypt is free to take Judah as a vassal nation in terms of legal authority, and basically, the end is here. The rest is just details. Now that Josiah is dead, and the Egyptians having scurried off to the north for their little war, Judah naturally has to pick the next king, and the natural successor is Josiah's son Jehoahaz. Now he wasn't quite as pious as his father, none of these later kings are, but he has little time to do anything, as three months later, with the end of Egypt's military campaign in Mesopotamia, the Egyptian army passes back through Judah. The Egyptians had been defeated at the town of Haran, but they're still strong enough to come back and enforce their dominance over the entire Levant, declaring that all former Assyrian vassals in the region are now Egyptian vassals, and especially Judah, since they lost in a battle against Egypt. And by the way, Egypt never gave Judah the permission to crown a new king, and being vassals, that's Egypt's prerogative now. So they pull Jehoahaz off the throne, just for the, for the fun of it, and they throw him into an Egyptian prison, also presumably for the fun of it. And they put Jehoiakim on the throne instead. And they also demanded a ton of tribute, which was duly paid. Jehoiakim was another ancestor, or another son of Josiah. Four years pass, and what do you know? The Egypt-Babylon War gets worse and worse for Egypt, and Babylon conquers all the Levantine land that Egypt had so briefly claimed, including tiny Judah, who was treated exceptionally poorly for having been an Egyptian vassal. So after a few years, Jehoiakim rebelled against Babylon, and they happened to be busy at that particular moment, but pretty soon a massive army came by, crushed the rebellion, and carried Jehoiakim off to prison, probably just for the fun of it. The scripture isn't super clear on this, but it seems like Jehoiakim was captured outside of Jerusalem, probably fighting a pitched battle somewhere against the Babylonians, and so on his capture, Jehoiachin became king for the next three months. It was only three months, though, because that's how long it took for the Babylonian army to get to Jerusalem, lay siege to it, crush it, and plunder the city. Both people and possessions were carried away in large numbers, the people becoming possessions in the brutal mathematics of ancient warfare. Nebuchadnezzar grabbed a royal relative, as was customary, named Zedekiah, and put him on the throne in Jerusalem, and he ruled as a vassal king for 11 years, and managed to butt heads with the prophet Jeremiah, and eventually Zedekiah also decided that he too should rebel against Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar disagreed with this and sent yet another army to sack and destroy Jerusalem in 586 BCE, beginning the famous Babylonian exile destroying the Temple of Solomon, and generally making a bad time of it for the people of Judah. But that is the end of that. It took us a year to get from Genesis to the sack of Jerusalem, which I really should have expected, but somehow didn't. Like I said at the start of today's episode, I have a few more Bible-focused ideas that I kind of want to turn into episodes, and... However many I come up with will get released between now and the end of the year, but then that will be the end of it. Come January 1, or 
really January 10 to keep a consistent posting schedule, we're going to wind the clock way, way back to 935 BCE and head back to Mesopotamia for a good long look at the rise and fall of the mighty Assyrian Empire. If you've been enjoying this show, please consider rating or reviewing or liking or subscribing or whatever you do on the platform that you listen on and share with your friends. That'd be a great help. And as always, thanks for listening.